Christian. She's had Simeon just earlier, you know, saying, oh, this is the Messiah who has come. She knows all that, but, and she knows she isn't superior to God. But in that moment, the emotion overwhelmed her. The fear overcame her, and that accusation came. Jesus, why are you doing this to me? Why are you, you know, hurting my, me? Why are you going against me? And, you know, Bill was talking about this this morning, and um, I was just like, obviously God's got something in this. But just the disabling and disorientating power of fear, the disabling and disorientating power of fear in our lives, that it can actually scramble the truth that we do know and that we long to live in daily, can't it? Like, we know this stuff, and yet when something comes, the emotions come over us, and suddenly we're overwhelmed and we're terrified. I think just it's important to know that I believe emotions are good. I believe they're God-given. And actually feeling those emotions, um, giving space for those emotions, grieving those emotions is all totally appropriate. But actually when we allow them then to define our truth, when we allow them then to take precedent over the truth that we know about Jesus, that's when it becomes a problem. Um, and just really encourage you tonight, you know, that if, if you're carrying fear, if there's a fear that is just ruining your joy in this season, it's just want to push in with you tonight into the truth of Jesus and into his love, into his um, power to be over all things in your life, no matter how fearful you feel in this season. But how does, Mary, how does Jesus respond to Mary? In verse 49, why were you searching for me? He asked, didn't you know I had to be in my father's house? But they did not understand what he was saying to them. Now, we don't know at this stage whether Jesus had this conversation with Mary publicly, with everybody watching, or whether he was private, you know, with her privately. But how do we interpret his response, which does sound dismissive, which does sound um, disinterested and kind of, you know, just whatever that is. It just feels like that. Um, but when we look at Jesus consistently throughout the New Testament, Jesus upholds scripture that commands you to honor your father and mother. He upholds and he compels his followers to honor women in a culture where that is not the case. He shows consistently a compassion, a grace, a mercy for those who are struggling and wrestling. So what is going on here? Um, I don't think it is petulance at all. But when I was just thinking about this, I think just inherently Jesus has the heart of a teacher doesn't he? And if we think about as he goes through his ministry, he teaches. Everything that he's doing is with an aim to teach, an aim to help them understand and grow and understand more of who God is. And he is growing in this stage, but that is, that is his heart. And I just wonder if we look at it through the lens instead of rather than presuming that his questioning was to condemn or to shame his mother, that actually it was an invitation into understanding more of who he is and what he was born to do. If you consider the story of the Samaritan woman at the well in John 4, Jesus questioned her. He knew her background, he knew her story, but he questioned her not through a lack of knowledge, but in grace and gentleness, just to invite that woman in to trust and to revelation about herself and about Jesus. Or if we look at Peter in Matthew 14, and he has got out of the boat in the storm, he's walking on water towards Jesus. The fear comes, he starts to sink, and what's documented is Jesus saying, you have little faith, why did you doubt? I just don't believe that Jesus did that in condemnation to him. <laughs> Actually, fair play, Peter, you got out of that boat. Most people wouldn't have. You know, I think much more it is just Jesus saying, Peter, why did you doubt? You were so close. You're doing so well that actually it wasn't Jesus condemning him, but inviting him into more, saying there's so much more, Peter. You got this far. You could have made it all the way. I think it's just that invitation of Jesus. And just I wonder tonight if, if for you, maybe you've been brought up, maybe you've been brought up in a conservative background, particularly where what you feel from Jesus is condemnation where when you experience, when you hear something that is a conviction on your spirit, your response is fear. Your response is um, to shrink away, is to feel condemnation. I, in my surgical career, unfortunately, it is um, characteristic that you learn by humiliation. That's what you're always told. And it's awful. That doesn't encourage you to learn. That just makes you feel rubbish and scared and upset and crying cupboards, which I've done quite a lot. Um, you know, but actually, do we believe that that's God's heart for us, that when he brings us conviction, do you think his heart for you is that you cry in a cupboard? I don't think so. <laughs> I think it is that God's heart for you is that he can reach in and he can say, come, child, come, let's grow into this, that we can learn to understand his heart for our growth and our freedom and to actually to actively invite the conviction and the probing of the Holy Spirit because we don't need to fear it. Because actually with that revelation, maybe we are remaining in bondage to doubt or to fear or to hurt or to sin or to brokenness. 
And that actually that revelation is to bring us into freedom, not to bring us into shame. And condemnation and guilt is not of God, but conviction that leads to freedom and repentance is. You know, so just actually actively inviting and receiving the probing of the Holy Spirit as a gift to lead us into more of Christ is, is the posture we get the privilege to have. Not sin, not condemnation, not guilt. Verse 49. Why were you searching for me? He asked. Didn't you know I had to be in my father's house? Use of the word father, again, a taste of the divine nature that even at the age of 12, Jesus was deeply conscious of his unique relationship between himself and his father in heaven. And it's further demonstrated by his description, I had to be or I must be. And Jesus's entire life was controlled by the divine must, which was in complete harmony with his own desire. If we look, for example, in John 10, verse 17 to 18, the reason my father loves me is that I lay down my life only to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord, my own desire. I have authority to lay it down and authority to take it up again. This command I received from my father. The gospels are full of this idea of necessity, of decree. Jesus must preach, Luke 4, 43. He must suffer, Luke 9, 22. He must go, 33. Must stay at the home of Zacchaeus, must be delivered up crucified, rise again, 24 verse 7. He must fulfill Old Testament prophecy, 24, 44. That compulsion of calling, the obedient following of the Spirit of God, and just Jesus trusting in his divine goodness and God's divine goodness and sovereignty over his life. Jesus walked in that alignment of desire and calling. And we are not Jesus, we're not divine, but we have the power of God within us. And I believe that can be our experience of life now, is that we can walk in alignment of desire and calling. And what Bill was describing this morning really resonated with us again, is actually when we're stepping into the things of him, we can know fullness of life with him. And if we look at Psalm 37, those famous verses four and five, trust in the Lord and do good, dwell in the land and enjoy a safe pasture, take delight in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord, trust in him, and he will do this. Or Proverbs 3, again, very famous, 5 and 6, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to him and he will make your path straight. Can I tell you tonight that I believe desire is good? I believe desires are God-given. And as we spoke about this morning and reiterate again, our primary desire should and needs to be the calling of Jesus in our lives, the pursuit of him, of becoming people of love, of becoming people like Jesus. But the other desires that we carry are important. They actually define us. They define what gives us joy, what gives us life, what gives us hope. And when those desires are submitted to Jesus, then we can actually walk in clarity and fulfillment. And do you know tonight that you can trust him with your desires? If that's a desire for a partner, if it's a desire for children, if it's a desire for a ministry, if it's a desire for a relationship, you can trust him with those desires. I don't believe that God dangles things in front of your face and then goes, that's not a good father at all. What I believe is that if there's a desire when surrendered to the God, when they're surrendered to the Holy Spirit, he will either honor it in his time or he will release you from it. And that should give us great hope and great joy right now. Even if there's, sorry, even if there's something that we're holding on to that we're not seeing yet, that we can live now in hope and we can live now in joy, not in regret, not in frustration, not in begrudgment, not in discontent. We can live in joy now and we can live with hope for the future that he'll either honor it or release us from it. He's good. He will not leave us dangling. And just feel like for so many of us that we live our present reality now just with the, with the pain of unfulfilled desire. Um, because it's not surrendered to him and we're struggling to trust him with it. I've now lost my place. You'll be glad to hear. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yeah, let's not let unfulfilled desire rob our joy in this season. What a waste, do you not think? <laughs> if we're so focused on what we don't have, we forget what God has for us right now. But you can trust him with those good things that he's placed in your heart and you can expect him to honor them or to release you from them. Verse 50, but they did not understand what he was saying to them. Mary still didn't understand. Despite like bringing Jesus up and being with him every day, <laughs> she still didn't understand what was going on. And I think it does unveil the challenge that she was just very familiar with Jesus. He was there all the time and just maybe just really struggled to see what, um, who and what Jesus was. And Jesus acknowledged his, 
acknowledged that himself when he said, you know, that even the prophet isn't recognized in his own land, that actually there is a danger in being over familiar with the person of Jesus. And for a lot of us here, we have had the immense privilege and joy of being raised in a Christian family, of being raised in a church. But just would encourage you tonight, are you over familiar with that? Do you actually recognize the immense privilege that it is to come into the presence of Jesus? Do you recognize the joy it is to walk hand in hand with him through every situation in your life? Perhaps you're coming into church and instead of being absolutely blown away by the immense privilege of worship, you're thinking, I hate that that chair sits there. It really bothers me that lights up, right? It's annoying that those drums are so loud. Can I just suggest that's over familiarity with the privilege of church, you know? And those things, I, they totally augment and help. I get that. But actually just for too many of us, we become over familiar with the person of Jesus. And we just really encourage us again tonight, Holy Spirit, if that conviction is from you, just receive that and say, God, am I over familiar with you and how I conduct my relationships and how I communicate to the people about you, about you, um, who I love, about how I engage with church, how I worship amongst your people. Jesus, guard us from over familiarity. Um, Verse 51, but his mother treasured all these things in her heart. In Mary's journey of understanding or her evident lack of understanding in this situation, um, I just love that. And again, it just shows you how Jesus must have spoken to her. She didn't recoil. She didn't hide. She didn't cry. Um, so whatever way he did it, he did it kindly <laughs> because actually her response was to treasure it. Um, and she didn't reject those encounters of learning. She didn't walk in shame that she didn't know. She didn't walk with embarrassment that, oh, I didn't get it, I had to be challenged. Actually, she just recognized and she treasured it. She savored it. She recognized that every chance to learn is an opportunity to grow. And just tonight, again, if you are somebody who's either new in faith or journeying in faith, do not walk in shame about what you do not know. Okay, there's no shame actually in not understanding. There's no shame in not getting it. Actually, God's heart for you is not that you know loads, but that you become a person of love. That actually for too many of us, we listen to so many podcasts and books and that we're information overloaded, but we never actually allow it to permeate to the people that we are. We never actually allow it to make us people like Jesus. We can know loads, but still not reflect his heart at all. And so whatever your stage of learning this evening, like Mary, whatever you receive from Jesus, that you can treasure it and you can savor it. And that allows that formation, that beautiful development into the person of Jesus to come into your life. So don't worry about what you do not know. Instead, savor what you do and allow that to really transform and allow you to become more like the person of Jesus. We are all growing and learning. And even Jesus had to. If we look at verse 51, then he, Jesus, went down to Nazareth and was with them, sorry, went to Nazareth with them and was obedient to them. And Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. Now, just before the passage we read, it had, it is kind of suffixed with and the child grew. And then at the end, and Jesus grew. And that reiteration means that it's important. And I don't know if you realized, I get my head around this, that from the time of Jesus' conception, he didn't have in completeness the spiritual gifts that actually he grew suggests that there was a maturing or development in the personhood of Jesus. And the beauty, and that's the beauty in the mystery of Jesus being both fully human and fully divine. And it takes nothing from his glory that he altogether emptied himself, that he chose to come into human form. And it doesn't degrade him or shame him that he had things to learn, but he chose not only to grow in body, but to have to learn in mind as well. If we look at Hebrews 2 verse 17, for this reason, he had to be made like them, fully human in every way, in order that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in service to God, and that he might make atonement for the sins of the people, because he himself suffered when he was tempted. He is able to help those who are being tempted. However, the difference between us and him is our need to learn is necessity that we can't avoid, much to most of our annoyances, that we don't know everything all the time. Um, that's the reality of our human form. But Jesus actively chose this weakness. He voluntarily submitted to that and of his own accord. Jesus chose humanity and submitted to its limitations. And he submitted to his undoubtedly flawed parents and their parenting. Um, even in his pain and suffering, even when he went to the cross, he submitted. And even on the back of what Bill was sharing last, you know, last week um, about suffering and about God's sovereign hand, God is not asking us to journey anything he himself has not journeyed through. 
He is not detached or indifferent to the pain that your situation is in. He's not um, etherly and above the consequences of that pain in your family and in the people around you. Because actually Jesus, act, he chose to submit to that so that he could journey through it and walk through it with us. That he is not detached and indifferent, but he is intimately involved and he is longing to invite us to experience more of him through all that we journey through. And that is the immense beauty of this Jesus who demonstrates his, his weakness in scripture as a child, as a baby, but then how he grows to a man because then with him we can grow too. And we can see in him, we can mirror in him our life and our experience and see the power that he offers to us every single day. So just to invite the worship team back up again, but the problem with presumption, I just wonder what is God maybe inviting you to lay down and surrender tonight? Is it that there are habits and routines, ministries, relationships that the presence of Jesus was in, but in this season he isn't? And that's really sad. That, that could be a real source of grief for some people here where you acknowledge that things have changed. But just want to encourage you, is there something in that that you need to lay down or invite the presence of Jesus into? Are there unhealthy beliefs that you need to lay down tonight? Are there desires that you need to surrender to him and allow him to work into? Are there false presumptions about Jesus, about yourself or others that you need to lay down tonight? Or maybe God's inviting you into something different tonight to take hold and step into something new, maybe to just recalibrate, to seek and ensure that his presence is in every step of everything that you're doing, in every journey that you walk on, every encounter you have. Maybe it is to trust those desires to him, those ones that you hold really, really dear, to trust them to him and to embrace joy in the season, despite that desire not yet um, being fulfilled, whatever that season looks like for you. Or maybe it is to embrace this stage of learning, not to walk in shame about you, what you do not know, but to embrace the season of learning and to allow Jesus to form you into a person of love that he longs for you to be, that we can treasure, rejoice, and expect to grow and follow our amazing example in the person of Jesus. Mm -hmm.